Right. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, pleasure. This is rather imposing. <laughs> I feel like I've come for an interview, a job interview. Well, you can sit on you can sit on the table if you can want. We've had people do all sorts of crazy Lotus things. Lotus position. In there. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, um, thanks for uh, being Pleasure. here today, um, yeah. and uh, glad you could make it over. Yeah. So I suppose um, lots of the audience here best know you for um, the thick of it, and it's probably um, you know the yes minister of our generation. What was it that initially got you into into writing this? What what gave you that idea that um, this is something that people would like? It was sort on. of, uh, it was the, it was Tony Blair's invasion of Iraq, um, <laughs> which was always going to be funny. Um, it was, uh, it was, I, I just, you know, I've, I was obsessing about how his administration, as it were, worked, and it seemed to be very concerned with timetabling and announcing things and then announcing <laughs> them again, and the whole, I, I, he brought in this whole culture of spin and you know, Alistair Campbell had the grid system where every day they'd, they would try to work out in advance what was going to happen on that day. You know, forgetting that actually in real life, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, there's no way of knowing and things turn up. The thing, you know, Harold Macmillan had that phrase, events, dear boy, events. And events got in the way. And so there would then be this mad scramble to make their announcement <laughs> fit what was actually really going on, which was more important than what they were announcing. And then their attempt, whenever something bad happened, to try and, try and correct it, but they corrected it in such an obvious way that it made it worse. And I just thought that was a, there was a naturally funny dynamic to that. Yeah. So there was that. And then I also did think, you know, the decision to invade Iraq, how did that come about? How did someone, just by sheer dint of his personality, and his will and his belief <coughs> persuade not just his close circle, but the cabinet and then parliament and then indeed the electorate that this was a, uh, this was a valid decision to make. So then, you know, that started raising questions about, well, how is our democracy working now? That actually every expert in the land is saying this will be a terrible mess, mm -hmm. is being ignored, and, and, and yet one person by just dint of their charisma or leadership or whatever, is able to corral a whole country into, into doing so. So that was it. I mean, it's a very serious answer, but it's, it's, that's fundamentally why. And then I thought, well, let's make that funny. Yeah. That's the other thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah. uh, last year, I think you wrote that you wouldn't write the, the thick of it now. And yeah. you felt um, pol politicians are being so far from what they actually are that there isn't really, you know, lots to laugh about with them because they Well, yes, it was more, yeah, the advent of like Trump, mm. I think, and and it just seems that politics now is going through a, a phase where I do worry that if you try and turn someone like Trump into a comedy character, he becomes a kind of plaything and he stops being dangerous. You know, he starts becoming acceptable. He starts becoming a fluffy, funny, stupid idiot <laughs> rather than someone who is the most powerful man in the world and who has got access to the nuclear codes and is deeply unstable. I mean, that's the truth of it. That, you know, today he's just fired the FBI director. director. Yeah. You know, he's, he's done in 108 days what it took Richard Nixon about six years to do in terms of having people having to resign, shutting, firing, you know, having inquiries. You know, he's got there rapidly. He's almost like a scandal prodigy, really. He's a sort of, you know, he's kind of a hyper scandal, uber scandal, really, in that he's, he's a concentrated ball of, of scandal that just is just going to go off at any second. Yeah. So what do you think is the most effective way of, you know, critiquing to a mass audience, people like this, if it isn't through satire? If is it, well, if it isn't I think satire is going through a truth. So what's happening is, um, you know, normally in satire, you take something that is true and then you bend it and twist it and exaggerate it so it becomes ridiculous. But that's what Trump does in every sentence he speaks. So, you know, when he starts a sentence, the first three words are fine. They're absolutely fine. And then, but, it, but it's as he keeps going, it kind of wanders off and doubles back in itself. And then it turns into a half sentence. He speaks in about five sentences at once. So he'll do a kind of, you, China is the marketplace. I say to you, and by the way, by the way, I tell you, I, you know, so there's five sentences going on at once. And, and he's a crazy, you know, it's crazy grammar punctuation. 
So, so he satirizes himself. He's a sort of self-basting satirist, right? <laughs> and then, so the, the, I think the real satirists who are kind of hitting home are the ones who do the flip side of that. And, uh, okay, you're doing the jokes, we'll do the facts. So you're John Oliver's and your Daily Shows and Samantha Bee and Bill Maher and, you know, a, a little bit of The Onion and, and things like that. Just actually go, okay, you're crazy. <coughs> let's, actually say, let's actually dig out what you said two years ago or what someone you who you've now put in a position of authority in your administration did three years ago uh, and let's make fun of that let's let's explore the differences between what you said there and what you're doing now that's that's where i think satire is beginning to find its way of approaching trump having said that there's a really silly thing called uh, sassy trump on youtube i, I don't do you know Peter Serovinovich? You know, this yeah. actor, Peter, does voice and stuff. And all he does, he does this thing on YouTube called uh, Sassy Trump, which is, he just revoices Trump. He doesn't change what Trump says, but he just revoices it because Trump does these kind of <laughs> gestures like this, yeah? And, but he's trying to project this alpha male image. So Peter just revoices him. So, so actually, he sort of speaks like that, you know? <laughs> and I tell you, China, ah, <laughs> uh, ah. Uh, you know, and by the way, <laughs> these huge missiles, you know, and it really just sucks all the machismo out of him. Uh, but the interesting thing is, it then makes you genuinely listen to what Trump is saying, you know, because you're not <laughs> thrown away by the kind of projected kind of uh, character that he's trying to project. And you start, then you start realising how troubling this guy is. Previously, um, lots of writers of, you know, satire, of sketches would, and sitcoms would set out to offend, you know, to yeah. outrage people. Do you think it's hard, becoming harder to write that sort of satire today when, you know, corporations and producers are afraid of offending people? Yeah, people are afraid of offending. And, and I always said about that, you know, nothing is off limits, but if you're writing about it, you have to have a line of thought, a clear line of thought or an argument or, a, or some wit. Uh, I don't like comedy that is set calls itself offensive and all it is is just offending. Do you know what I mean? There's no yeah. comedy behind it. They just think to say a terrible thing is, is all that is required. And I, I, I kind of feel you've got to have some set of constraints, if only to try and break those constraints, because I think it makes you work harder. I think what's happening though is, and it, that does worry me, is that people equate offence with injury. And I actually think, I do actually, think what's wrong with being offended you know if you have a set of religious or political beliefs and if somebody says something against them y y those beliefs if you really believe them you should have a strong enough belief in them to be able to withstand that attack if you see it as an attack rather than and what is happening a lot I think is just the shutting down mm -hmm. of the argument so if somebody says something we block them we unfollow them we non-platform them you know because and what that means is we don't engage with them so we then end up with two, uh, two, two groups of people who will not meet halfway, will not even contemplate the idea of having a conversation. And that's what happened, I think, over Brexit, in that you have the Remain camp and the Brexit camp, who still act as if we're having, still having the debate, and the, the other side are our opponents. So you have, uh, and they also take opposing views. They, you know, the Brexit people still act as if they lost in that they call anyone else who disagrees with them a traitor, disloyal, attacking the country. The Remain camp still act as if they won or if they didn't win it's because we misread the result but we'll sort it out because we, we did win. I mean because we're us yeah. and you know and it makes perfect sense. I don't quite see how this result came about so we'll, 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 uh, we'll, let's look at the rules again. I think we got it, somebody got it wrong. So, you know you stay entrenched in these camps and therefore there's no conversation going on between them. That's, that's the thing that worries me, that we kind of become frightened of wanting to engage in, in any kind of debate uh, with someone who might radically disagree with us, you know. When do you think this is going to end? Uh, you know, with the upcoming general election, this is still a big undercurrent. You, you know? Well, yeah, the thing in the election is there's no debate. That's the problem. Theresa May will not debate. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn will not debate if Theresa May is not debating. Um, they'll go on the one show yeah. or they'll, you know. <laughs> so in the end, the debate we got so far has been Theresa May debating her husband. That's the debate <laughs> we've had so far. Uh, uh, that's it. And, and all the events that have been staged have been stage managed so that reporters are having to 
tell in advance the questions that they're going to ask so that the party managers can decide which question. You know, so it's all being stage managed. And yet the whole point of this election, which we've got to remind ourselves, we didn't have to have. The whole point of this election was so that the country can have a debate about Brexit and about the terms for Europe. And yet debate is stymied. So that's the... And I just think it's getting worse and worse. The, 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 the fewer, I mean, in a general election, you know, now hopefully in the next four weeks this will change. In general election, you're meant to d discuss everything. You're meant to discuss housing, education, <coughs> health, um, welfare, tax, everything. That's the point of a general election. It's not about give me a strong mandate to go into Europe. I don't think when Theresa May goes into Europe, people, the, the other 27 countries are going to go, oh my God, she got a lot of people to vote for her. What are we going to do? <laughs> you know? And I also think it's actually quite, um, it's a con. It's a con to say only a vote for me is a vote for our country. Because that's how one party states are, uh, arrive. Uh, the fact that to vote for someone else is somehow disloyal is undermining the country. That's, you know, that's her dictatorship. I'm not saying Theresa May is a dictatorship, but her language and her argument is extremely lazy and extremely dangerous. Do you feel the press are letting the electorate down? Do you think they should be, you know, complying and sending their questions through for pre-screening? Do you not no, feel they should no, they be shouldn't. forcing but, but these questions a bit more? the thing, of course, the bulk of the more. press is very, you know, Theresa May leaning. Um, I don't know what you do about that, but uh, I, I think it's up to us to uh, somehow you know, um, campaign for a little bit more of discussion going on. I and mean, that's why I'm spending a lot of time at the moment trying to persuade you lot to register and to vote, even if you don't, you know, I don't care how you vote, but, you know, if you don't vote, if the, the, the 18 to 24 year old vote has been going down repeatedly in past elections, and what that means is politicians don't regard you as a threat. If you're not going to vote, great, we could take money from you. When we have to make cuts, we'll put up tuition fees, we'll withdraw, uh, student disability ben allowance will 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 say that the living wage doesn't kick in till you're 25 you know because if you feel upset about that the chances are you won't vote so that's fine and that's what labor lib dem and tory politicians have done over the last 20 years so uh, you know if you want to have a little bit more power register and say you're going to vote you know if you end up saying none of the above i don't really care if it's you know a pair of balls and a cocker or whatever i don't you know up to you up to you um it'd be funny if they got in though wouldn't it a bit um <laughs> balls and a cock uh First 259 yeah. um do you know what I mean? because the, the the politicians that spent the last week talking about the triple lock and pensions and they've been doing that because the over 65 vote is about 75 80 percent so they know that the the older vote is something that they have to um go out and win so what do you say to young voters who choose not to register? They say, you know, I don't see anything that I agree with here. All the three major political parties are the yeah, same Yeah, and to I me. can absolutely understand that, and, and which is why I'm saying, you know, we'll spoil your paper then. Because if you actually withdraw from the debate, if you don't vote, you're actually withdrawing from de democracy. And we end up with a, a, a smaller and smaller pool of people who are voting. And yet... That's not affecting how politics works because, you know, no matter how few votes a party gets, if it's more than the other lot, they get total power. And a party with total power is not going to go, yeah, but we didn't get many votes, you know, comparatively, in comparison with governments of 20 years ago, so we'll, we'll tone it down a bit. No, they have total power. So if you want to affect how power is practiced, you have to participate. In, in, in the election in one way or another. And so there are lots of tools out there and with pollsters predicting, you know, in large Tory majority. Yeah. Do you think they should go out there onto these websites and vote tactically? You know, well, there are like, lots of yeah. websites on. So it depends what it is you're after. You know, if you want to vote for a Brexit candidate or a Remain candidate, or if you want to vote for a candidate who's best placed to maybe not let a Conservative in, that's, that's you. That, yeah, but there are, there are, there is information out there as to how you can go about and find out how that affects your constituency. Uh, I, I'm really not saying, I'm not telling you how to vote, I just want you to vote. I just want the, the, you know, the 18 to 24 year old vote to go up in this election because it then means that next election, politicians are going to be a lot more careful about how they treat that constituency.
Sure. No, that makes sense. Very more. serious, this. I thought this would be a <laughs> <Yeah>. absolute <laughs> hoot. He's just <laughs> talked about constitutional kind of <laughs> implications of, of... We've talked about basically fascism for the last 20, 20 I, minutes. I'm really. quite... Yeah, yeah, I'm sure lots of people in the audience aren't as serious as I am. Hopefully. No, no, no. Um, it's, yeah. it's fine. I mean, I'm quite happy to. <laughs> well, I, I think lots of people did come here to um, hear you talk about you know, the thick of it, yeah, deep. So yeah. let, let's go back to that. We were chatting earlier and you said you've been, you know, hopping across the pond quite a lot. Yes. And think, obviously, yeah. you know, you're working on, on Veep and the other yeah. projects there. What do you think are the differences writing for these two audiences? Do you find a difference when you're writing for the um, Well, it was audiences? more, I mean, what we didn't decide to do was completely replicate the thick of it, you know, just change the names and so on. Because, you know, in the thick of it, it's a very junior minister with very little influence being bullied, basically, by... Number 10 and, and the people from Number 10, who are all called enforcers. That's the actual phrase. Malcolm, they're all these rather anonymous, they sound like the Dementors really, but they go out, they go out among the departments and tell them what to say, what not to say, how much money they've got, what to think, what to believe, and then fuck off. And then, <laughs> so there's that. But uh, in Veep, it's really, it's in the White House. And you know, if someone like Malcolm spoke like that to the vice president, he'd be shot, you know, he'd be yeah. <laughs> removed from the build, building and bundled into the back of a car and taken yeah. away. You just don't do that because you forget in America, the president is the head of state, not just an elected politician. They don't like being called politicians, by the way, in America. Politicians. Don't like it. You've got to call them congressman or senator or, or whatever. They don't, the idea that they're a politician is somehow a demeaning yeah. phrase that doesn't represent who they are. They, they relish that status that they have um, and there is an element in America of you respect the office if not the person you you know you might not agree with Trump but you respect the office of president you have to show deference in terms of the ceremony and go on there so it's a very different and also you know the decisions they make do have an impact do reflect across the country do have an impact on people's lives and and across the world you know if if Trump withdraws from the Paris Climate Agreement, it will have an impact internationally. So that's what Veep is about. It's about, and also the funny dynamic there, I think is, is being vice president, being close to power, but not being in power, being right next door to power. But one day you could have the power. And that was the whole, um, I spoke to, um, when we were researching the show, I spoke to uh, the chief of staff for both Al Gore and Joe Biden. And, and he said that really America is a country it's all about being number one. And being vice president, you might as well wander around with a badge saying, I came second. And, and <laughs> vice presidents, when they come into a room, are treated with respect, but they know when they leave the room, people are laughing at them. And that's just part of the job. That's just the, the status they have. So I thought that was a kind of funny... Um, and, and also the power you have as a vice president is really, in the end, the gift of the president. So if the president wants you to be a powerful vice president, then you can be. So Dick Cheney was, and um, Mike Pence is. Um, if he wants you to be a non-entity, you can, you will be, like uh, Dan Quayle was yeah. under George Bush Senior. Sure, yeah. okay. So one, one um you know, the thick of it, you had lots of politicians, um, lobbyists, civil mm. servants coming up to you and say, you know, I recognise this. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. If only, you know, things were as good as they were in the yeah, thick of it. Yeah. Do you have the same in the States? Do you have... No, there's an element of that. Things happen. Th no, you, well, the, the worst bit is when you write a fiction and you make it as stupid as possible and then somebody <laughs> afterwards says, how did you find that out? Because <laughs> we kept that really quiet. And we find it keeps happening in... Uh, in the very first episode of The Thick of It, they have to come up with a cheap policy in the back of a car <laughs> on the way to make an announcement because Malcolm's pulled all the funding from the one they wanted to announce. So they're, they're you know, the swapping ideas, something that's popular and cheap. Hanging? Should we bring back hanging? No. <laughs> you know, and, and what happened was we were still in the car. We'd shot the scene, but we were still in the car on the way to the next location. So I said, look, just make stuff up. See what happens. Make stuff up. So this was Chris Addison and, you know, everyone. And... And genuinely, in the scene, three of those policies that they improvised within the next four years became law. <laughs> <laughs> they were, um, uh, it was uh, anti-social asbos for pets, yeah. basically. Pet asbos. <laughs> Compulsory for everyone to have their own plastic bag. 
and uh, a national spare room database, which became, <laughs> which became the bedroom tax, uh, you know. And it's just, and I've had, I've had senior political figures come up to me and say, I've been in the back of that car. And, and similarly, in America, we did, when Selena Meyer was campaigning for president, we thought we'd give her a campaign slogan that was like, meant nothing. It wasn't, you couldn't, you know, it, it wasn't in any way interesting. It was the blandest, made no sense, it was called, and, and it was, um, it was continuity with change, was, <laughs> right? Any, any, any Australians here? Any Austra Yes. So Malcolm Turnbull, the Prime Minister, yeah. a year later, not yeah. even a year later, used that as his campaign slogan. <laughs> and, and he was cast, he, he used continuity and change. And he was castigated by it. And, and his office replied, no, 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 it's different because in, in Veep it's continuity with change. Our campaign slogan is continuity and change. So we're actually giving you two things. We're actually, <laughs> you know, it's a positive. It's a positive, you know. So that happened. I mean, uh, <laughs> there was another one recently. I'm trying to think. Well, oh, I, I mean, they, it, it, it goes on. And you try to think, you try not to be depressed by how easily that happens. But it, but it happens con continually. An ongoing theme is, you know, these yeah. overlords or these controllers trying to keep their ministers, you know, in yeah. check. Do you, do you think that's still the case today or are ministers and politicians more able to go up there and do, do their own thing? Well, I think in sort of response to the Blair kind of absolute control freakery, yeah. I think they try to... Um, every year they promise that they're going to reduce the number of special advisers and every year it goes up. Because every minister goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, generally, as an idea in principle, that's fine. But I think I need, I think my department in particular does need a few more, you know. Uh, and, and that happens. And I think they, of what they try and avoid is the sort of the grammar of, of spin control. So you won't have, Theresa May, she does have, she has two senior uh, policy advisors that, uh, uh, and they do impose complete control on the other departments because what's happened over the last 20 years is that politics in the UK has got very centralised. You know, A, it's got centralised in London and then B, it's got centralised in the Prime Minister's office and the Treasury, and that dictates what every other department will do. So you lose that sense of ministers who have their own little fiefdom and can actually have a bit of personality about themselves, you know. Blair used to sack anyone who had any personality, you know. <laughs> so soon, you know, your Robin Cooks and your Mo Morlams and all, they all just disappeared and, and then died, actually, strangely enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know what... <laughs> anyway. In years to come, one or two of you will be asked to join MI5 at some point. You know, it will happen. And I wouldn't mind you finding out and getting back to me <laughs> why all these politicians ended up dying. I'm just saying. Looking yeah. forward. I once actually gave a talk to MI5 about comedy, by the way, <laughs> like in a room not unlike this. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, um, but it was like M's kind of briefing chamber. And so, because I said on the phone, I said, uh, I, I, I want to play some clips. Is the DVD player? And they, and they did this kind of full kind of amateur. Uh, is there a DVD? Yeah, we'll rustle something up. And you arrived and it was this big kind of briefing chamber where you just, you didn't even touch anything. You put your hand over it and the lights went down. And then you did that and a screen came up. <laughs> and you went like that, vroom. And like, they started playing, and he went, boof, and it stopped, and stuff like that. But it was all civil servants, basically, who, uh, who were in the audience. And then there was cheese and wine, MI5 cheese and wine afterwards. And they had MI5 parish notices, which was like the bring and buy sale last week, raised <laughs> £400 for Great Ormond Street Hospital. So well done. He thought, but you must be siphoning, like, <laughs> money launderers and everything. You must be able to get 400 quid out of that, surely, for the Great Ormond Street Hospital. But anyway, uh, that's another thing. So, yes, I don't know, what was the question? Um, <laughs> yeah, dead, dead politicians. Yeah. No, I do guarantee there will be at least one or two of you in this room in the next three or four years who will be recruited by MI5. So I would love you to find out. What, what, if the, what, what happened? Why did all these politicians with any personality die? Yeah. Right. And yes. after you retired, come back and speak. We can never get spooks to come and speak. Oh, here. right. So, yeah, okay. yeah. You, can, you should go to that because they do have speaker evenings, which is why. But they have to do it kind of internally because of what they do. Yeah. So they go on theatre trips together and <laughs> kind of 
trips to Alton Towers and stuff like that. <laughs> and then he had, <laughs> then he had speaker evenings, yeah. And they were all very sheepish afterwards because they were introduced to me as something else. And then somebody told me, no, it's the security services. And somebody did come up and went, what happened when you found out it was really us? <laughs> In a kind of really sort of bashful kind of way. It was like, really. and, and I'd say, so what are you involved in? Oh, terrorism. Terrorism. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, yes. So, I still can't remember what the question was. Yes, go on. Um, yeah. No, it was, it was about politicians okay. and breaking yeah, yeah, yeah. free of them. Yeah. But that's fine. Um, yeah. At the moment, there's, you know, so much... Well, I suppose amusing, but like not so amusing material to write on. You know, the Brexit, with yeah. Trump and everything else. Are there any projects you're really keen on taking on at the moment? Something you'd really want to do? Well, Maybe I've a just, new film? I've new just series? finished doing a film, which will come out later this year, which is about dictatorship. It's called The Death of Stalin. And it's set in the period when Stalin is ill and then dies. And the power struggle in the Kremlin to take over. And it's based a lot of, on a lot of true events. But they're kind of funny in a crazily it's about what happens when someone terrorizes a country that you cannot move because if you make the wrong move you will be taken out and shot and what happened was stalin himself died because of terror because he told his guards he never wanted to be interrupted so when they hear him fall over because he's having a stroke none of them wants to knock on the door and be the first one to go in and fight. so he lies in a pool of his own urine for like a day and then when the politburo turn up no one wants to call for a doctor because earlier in the year, Stalin had a lot of senior doctors arrested because he was convinced they were going to poison him. So they have a debate about what kind of doctor. All the good doctors have been round up. So what do we do? Do we get a bad doctor? But if we get a bad doctor and Stalin finds out, yeah, but if he finds out, he's, that means he's, he's, he's survived. So it's a good doctor, isn't it, really? And if it is a bad doctor and he dies, then Stalin won't find out, you know? And they didn't use a respirator because it was American. It had an American plug on it. So they didn't use that. You know, it's that kind of thing going on. So that kind of frenzy in a world of, you know, hysteria, really. That, so that's what I finished looking at uh, doing that. And it's like Steve Buscemi plays Khrushchev and it's the power struggle between him and... Michael Palin is Molotov, and Jeffrey Tambor is who's fantastic, plays Malenkov, who's the deputy who takes over. It's, a, it's kind of, <laughs> so it's kind of first time I've done a costume drama, but also first time I've done something where it is funny, but there's also something deeply dramatic going on as well behind it. Yeah. Cool, great. Yeah. Well, I think I've um, asked you enough questions now, so if we go to the audience. Okay, hopefully should I stand up for this? Do you yeah, want yeah, me, so, you you can can so can your, see. you can see I'll your victims. I'll do that. Um, yeah. yeah, you I'll can do take that. a seat on here. Do yeah, I just move this. I'll do hi. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do casual comedy now. Yeah. yeah. So if, yes. you, if you have a question, just wait for the microphone to get to you first. It is a right. recording microphone only. Oh, it's a recording so microphone. Yeah, so okay. it won't amplify you. But yeah, feel right. free to... Uh, someone over there. I, I'd be a terrible David Dimbleby. <laughs> the, 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 the person there. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I the wanted to thing. ask about the uh, creative process, the thick of it. It's known, it's known for its sort of... Um, you still have to speak up because the microphone isn't attached to a speaker. <laughs> it's, it's just there to record you for posterity. <laughs> so, uh, so when you eventually are recruited to MI5, you'll have the power to delete <laughs> this. Anyway, sorry, go on. So you'll have to shout. Um, yeah. So the thing of it's, one of the things it's known for is those phrases like omni-shambles that yes. seem to kind of come from nowhere. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask how much of that was scripted, um, how yeah. much of that was It's all sort of scripted, improv? yeah. There's a little bit of <laughs> improvisation. Just interrupt for a second, just so you don't get um, skin cancer, could you move slightly out of the sun? Okay. So we uh, also get you on the, uh, the recording <laughs> of that as well. Um, is that all right? Okay. Right, well, I'll, I'll go to uh, Iceland then, yeah. shall I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> oh, this is much better. This is my, I know I'm doing a law lecture. This is great. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, the thick of it, the thick of it, young man, um, it's all, it, no, it's not, there's a little bit of improv, but that's really to make it sound like it's spontaneous. And so I asked the cast to learn the lines, but just to say them slightly over each other and slightly, um, just to dirty it up, to make it sound like conversation. Because we, you know, we don't finish our sentences, we talk over each other, we interrupt each other. And I, I wanted to lose that stage theatrical thing of, People very politely waiting till someone's finished their sentence before they then go, that's an interesting point, but I disagree because it just sounds fake. So that, but actually all those elaborate swearing phrases are all carefully, because, I mean, Peter Capaldi, who plays Malcolm, he has to learn those lines because they have to come out in a great ball of fury and you can't show any hesitation. So he goes away and learns them and we shoot in a 
sort of building full of these glass office, glass meeting rooms. And Peter would spend the day in a glass meeting room in his suit, learning the big diatribes. So you'd just see this man just pacing up and going, no, you fucking can't, because if you fucking do this, I'll fucking do this. You know, that for day after day, you know. Because um, uh, so, he's got to be able to... So a lot of effort goes into um, crafting those. And there's one, one of our writers who was very good at it, became uh, very early known as the swearing consultant on the, <laughs> on the show. And it's not, you know, it's just he, he was particularly good at it. But um, uh, a, a swearing correspondent, that's... A, it'd be funny if the news had a swearing... Cor- no, it's a, um, you join a... <laughs> you jo- the strike's in its fifth fu- fucking day and... Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> there's no way this shit is going to get cleared up. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so it, and, uh, so it's no, it's scripted. But then the whole, the whole element of rehearsing and shooting is about making it not feel like it's scripted. That actually, so if you think it's spontaneous, then that's good. In that we've achieved our aim of not <coughs> making it look like this is a, you know, a dramatic, uh, pre-written, rehearsed thing. It's the Gene Kelly thing of, you know, dancing, you know. If it looks like you're working hard, you're not working hard enough. You've got to work so hard that it looks effortless. It's that, that's the sort of principle behind it. Yeah. <coughs> right, a uh, question here. And just wait for the, um, the microphone that will consign you to all eternity um. <laughs> onto the internet. Yeah, oh, yeah. M- nervous. But now. you will still have to shout. That's the thing, it, and it's counterintuitive. It's, uh, it really is. It's um, yeah. it f- it feels like um, sort of left and right are so polarized these days yes. that um, that a lot of satire just feels like it's confirmation bias for whichever side it's supporting. So a Saturday Night Live sketch which presents Trump supporters as racists or whatever yes. is only going to appeal to people who hate Trump. Yes. And even something like Bill Maher, which is normally... Liberal, um, it's very liberal. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's just sort of based on facts. People still yes. find ways that oh, they, they disregard it for whatever reason. So is comedy able to bridge that gap? It's very difficult to do... Um, comedy about moderate politics that's the that's the problem because it used to be that the electric generally were in the middle and you had these fringes so so political comedy was about um discovering what was exaggerated and and extreme and now that uh politics has become so polarized that's what i'm saying the dilemma of the call call them the satirists that's their dilemma. What do they do other than just repeat? But I also do think you're, you're, you're then in danger of thinking that by doing political comedy, you're somehow going to change things. And I don't think you are. I think you, you go mad very quickly if you think that's what you can do by telling jokes or doing even something like the think of it, you can somehow change how people think and how people vote. Because it just doesn't work like that. You know, I think at best all you can do is illustrate something that maybe people haven't seen before. Uh, you know, Yes Minister, when Yes Minister first started, it really was, although it was like a very traditional sitcom, it was also a documentary because no one knew how politics worked behind those closed doors in Whitehall. Um, and there weren't even TV cameras or microphones in the Houses of Parliament. So Yes Minister was the first showing on television of, of what actually went on behind those closed doors. Uh, and then when the writer said, yes, and politicians have actually briefed us on storylines, you know, have passed true things on to us. And I think that's all you can do, really. You, all you can do is hope to reflect something of what's genuinely going on or of how politicians are genuinely thinking or of how they make, manipulate a- arguments and logic. But I don't think you can ever change how people will vote through comedy. I think that's mad if you think you can do that, really. Oh, I'll get back to you. Yeah. I'll, I'll do my bad, David. Yeah, oh, from there, thank you, you now. <laughs> you. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, uh, do you have any advice to the next generation of uh, potential satirists and writers of, of how to, to get into a position where you can well, produce uh, these things? Well, I always say to kind of writers, always, especially if you're writing comedy, always write what makes you laugh. Don't try and write for a different audience that's different to you. Don't try and write for some... 45-year-old programme commissioner for BBC One uh, because you'll end up not writing your best stuff. You've got to write what you genuinely find funny. 
because now that's not a guarantee of success, but it's a guarantee that you will do your best stuff. Uh, and then I, you know, and then you've got to keep writing. So don't wait for the call. Don't wait for someone to, hey, I hear you wrote a blog five years ago. A lot of people have been talking about it. Do you want to do a TV show? You've got to, you've got to create your kind of uh, portfolio, which is now easier to do because you can post stuff up online. It's now uh, easier to go out and shoot your own stuff. Again, that's no uh, guarantee that people will see it. But I think the more you make and the more you write, the better you'll be because you just learn something. I'm still learning. Every time you make something, especially if it's a new thing, you learn something from it. And that then makes the next thing you write, you can bring that, that newly acquired knowledge to the next thing. You know, that's what I'd say. Right, yeah, now from him to, to him then. And then a woman, we'll do a woman. <laughs> <laughs> this, this question has to come from one of, one of us oldies here, but uh, your almost equally talented predecessor, Tom Lehrer, oh, right. um, decided that he'd go back, back to being a maths teacher when yeah. he said satire was redundant because they gave Henry Kissinger the Nobel Peace Prize. That's right, yes. Can you, I'm not suggesting this for a second, but can you imagine such a point coming in your life? Well, I did, no, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I did think once they started using the word omni shambles in the House of Commons and started kind of acquiring elements of the thick of it, and I remember David Cameron calling Cobb in like an episode of The Thick of It at Question Times. I just thought, stop now, that's enough. Because, you know, uh, when Thick of It started, it was really trying to illustrate how, how, what I thought had gone wrong with politics. But if now politicians are seeing it as something to aim for, then you, I think that's the time to stop. So in a minor way, that's, that was a kind of cut-off point for me in terms of thinking, right, I should do something else because if we carried on like this, we'll then get requests from politicians to turn up in episodes of it because they love it so much, you know, and, and uh, I just didn't want that to happen. Happened a lot in, in America, we would get requests from governors and senators and, and, and a lot of pressure because it's slightly more done over there and, and I, I, I felt I had to kind of like just say no to that because the moment you do that you're and I'm not saying these people are hateful or despicable I think a lot of them go into politics for the right reasons and a lot of them do the right thing and stand by I, I just think though you've got to not get so close to these people that you start thinking do you know what I'll be I'll be kinder to that one now because you know he turned out to be nice most people are nice most people are really nice 90% of us are nice. But that doesn't stop us, you know, doing the wrong thing or doing something that we could do better. And, and, and something like think of it is really about pointing that out. It's not about saying, oh, for God's sake, don't go into politics because, you know, they're all animals and, and have no morals. It's not about that. I think the most sympathetic people in those shows are the, the elected politicians, actually. They feel the most human. But it's about trying to point out how, what, where the system has got to and where it might have slightly come apart, and therefore put the onus back on politicians and indeed the electorate to, to do something about it. Right, I said a woman. Is there a woman? There's a woman. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean it like that. I just, I'm just being my bad David Dimbleby. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, okay. Go yeah. for it. Um, you said that political satirists can't change the way that people might vote. Yes. But do you think shows like The Thick of It and Veep are important in engaging people with the well, idea I of politics? Well, I hope so. I hope they're more engaged than put people off. But um, um, I think, I, I, I mean, I, I did, there, there was no manifesto behind them other than, oh, I've looked at politics and this is what I've found. You know, what do you think? And so part of it is also as asking the viewer, if you were that minister, would you do the same? Because I think I probably would. Do you know what I mean? If I, if I was backed into a corner like that and I was, had to make up you know, my, my mind about something, I might make the wrong move and make the wrong decision. So it's about showing the hum, humanity behind it. I do think that we expect our politicians to be perfect. We don't like it when they're not perfect. We don't like it when, they're, when there's a train crash and one of them's away on holiday. Well, yeah, I mean... You can't predict what's going to happen when you go on holiday, you know. Um, I don't like it when we have a go at them because one of them spent some money on some dog food that they then accidentally claimed back and they're expect You know, we make these mistakes all the time. And if we expect every politician to be a saint, then we're not going to have many people uh, applying <laughs> for the job, really. You know, and, and as part of it is about trying to alert people to the fact that we put an undue amount of pressure and expectation on 
on poli politicians, really. You know, it's partly our fault. It's not, we can't blame them all the time for it. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, the one on the, the one furthest away from me <laughs> in that row. <laughs> 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 I'm going to drop this character now, this uh, <laughs> bad David Dimbleby. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Uh, my question relates to the film and television industry generally. Uh -huh. With the growing popularity of streaming platforms, yeah. first, how would you say that has changed the way that content is produced generally, and has that affected the way that you produce content um, in anticipation of the fact that many people will be viewing your work in streaming platforms as opposed to terrestrial television? Well, I, th I think it's changed the fact that we don't, you know, we now feel a bit annoyed if we have to watch something on a weekly basis. You know, now Netflix starting the whole trend of putting the whole series up. It's, it's something I fear because I always work to deadlines. So when we're shooting Veep, you know, episode one's going out, we still haven't even written episode 10, you know. So the idea of having the whole thing shot before the first one goes out is a nightmare. I, 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 th I think the answer to your question is nobody knows. I mean, really, nobody knows. A lot of really good stuff has been made, and a lot of really expensive to make stuff has been made. Nobody really knows how many people are watching it. I mean, there's too much stuff in a way, too much good stuff, that, that you can't watch everything that's out there. And I, at some point, something's going to fall apart. You know, some organisation is going to crumble because they just... But the thing is, nobody knows. And it's been like that on the internet for the last 10, 15 years. That, you know, how do you make money? How do you monetize? How do you monetize newspapers on the internet? Nobody knows. So it's in this... I think it's great at the moment because what it's m meant is that program makers are suddenly much in demand. You know, it used to be when you made comedy <laughs> 10, 15 years ago, really the BBC was the only show in town. So you had to make what the BBC wanted. And if the BBC didn't like it, and that was like two or three people, you couldn't make it. There was nowhere else to go. And then Channel 4 are making more comedy now. Sky is making more comedy. And then suddenly there's Netflix and there's, you know, suddenly actually, because everything is streamable, your audience is no longer the UK. Your audience is potentially the world. You know, Alan Partridge is now on North Norfolk Digital. He claims he has a potential audience of six billion <laughs> on North, you know, because, you know, you can access anything from anywhere. And what's good about our viewing habits is we don't really care where the show was made. You know, it could be a German drama or a Scandinavian <coughs> mystery or a detective as well as an American drama. Um, it's forcing uh, people in the British system to, to have to partner up with other, um, other outlets to, to make big budget things. So things like The Night Manager was a BBC show, but they, the money for that came from AMC. And the BBC does co-productions and Sky do co-productions with HBO. There's going to be a lot more of that. But at this moment, before it all falls apart, and it will fall apart soon, it's quite a good time to be a program maker because actually you're more in demand because people are, these big uh, organisations are hungry for, for more shows and putting more shows out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. There and then there and then there. <laughs> so from, from all the work that you've written, uh, what would you say is your favourite character uh, that you've written and favourite scene? Oh, Should right. Oh, gosh. Favourite character? I don't know. I mean, Alan is like, Alan Potter, he's just, he's just always been there, you know, right from the start. He's been there for like 23 years and, and he grows as Steve grows. You know, he gets older as Steve gets older. And what we've liked about doing Alan Partridge is that we haven't done him like every year. We, he, he comes, he, he, he sort of reconstitutes re himself every four or five years. So he's done a kind of radio and then a chat show and then the sitcom and then back on the radio and he's sort of grown with us. So whenever Steve and I meet, even if we're not doing Alan, we still kind of have at the back of our head a little running Alan. <laughs> so we say, so what's Alan up to now? Well, I think he's probably, you know, I've always wanted to do Alan. We always imagine Alan at some point doing those guided tours of Norwich on a double-decker bus. <laughs> just on a, just doing a kind of... But then... I think we were going to do this in the film, one version of the film script, and then we cut it because it didn't quite fit everything else. He goes down and actually he sees someone he, who he owes money to, so he asks the driver to take the tour elsewhere. <laughs> so they end up some, in some business park, 
But he's still having, because the customers are paid, he's still having to come up with interesting facts <laughs> about the buildings in the business park <laughs> in the hope that the people might not have seen him who he owes money to. That's, you know. So we have this kind of, we've had this kind of Alan in our heads for like 23 years. So I suppose Alan has to be a kind of, you know, a port of call. And funny scene, well, I always think Alan is at his happiest when he's, walking down the motorway with a bag of windscreen washer fluid, singing, singing Goldfinger. I think, I, think, I think that's when he's at his happiest, so I like, I like that scene, yes. So, yes, yeah, so I, I said I'd... Uh... Um, source of Alan related, I guess. Okay. Um, uh, uh, one of my, uh, actually, my two favourite shows of all time are The Day to Day and Brass Eye. Oh, right, okay. And I'll take credit for one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, one, uh, one, one thing that I just uh, absolutely adore about it is that it's uh, still so relevant today. Right. Uh, because right. news hasn't really changed in terms of its format in well, the last no. 20 Well, no. I mean, it's that thing of the omnishambles. It's like news journalists, oh, those who work in graphics, now say to me, oh, yeah, we've, we've very much modelled the show on the day-to-day. -day. And you just think, but no, but that was like, that was a dystopian vision of the future, that was. That wasn't like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, do you... Do you lament the fact that news hasn't changed in the last 20, years? Well, yeah, years? I do. I, cause, and, and it's not just like in terms of the look, but in terms of the, the attack, it's not, it doesn't feel, I, I, when I watch a news show now, I don't feel I've got the whole picture. I really don't. And this is why there is a little tiny bit of merit. This is why fake news from Trump is sort of lodging people's consciousness, because I think a lot of people think that. I mean, it's, I'm saying it in, in a tiny way. Because the news is, it's an artifice. It's, uh, when we were researching the day-to-day, -day, the BBC put Chris Morris and myself on a little television news course for the day, and we were given this challenge, we were given this task, which was we had the unedited rushes of an incident, it was the Bosnian War, an incident, we were given about two hours of footage, and we had like three hours to come up with a three-minute package, television package, that had three bits of information in it. So we had to edit the footage down, write the commentary over it, speak it, and, you know, we had three hours to deliver it as if for that evening's six o'clock news. And what I found with, like, ten minutes to go, I had the pictures for the first fact that I wanted to put in. I had the pictures for the second fact that I wanted. I didn't have any pictures for the third fact I wanted to put in. And with the clock ticking, what I did was I just struck out the third fact because there were no pictures. And that's where I realised that actually news is picture driven and it's, it's an editorialised subjective take on what's happened. It has to be. Someone has decided what's to go in and what's not to go in. And then someone else has decided how high up the agenda it is. Is it the main story or is it fifth? You know, so, you know, in all these things, even though they're factually true, there is an element of, not fakery, but of, of, of artifice about them, you know? And I think that's why Trump, who is, I think, in a way, a genius at just locking into tiny little residual fears that people have. That's why he is getting away with this fake news, because everyone now has that sense, I think, when they watch TV shows of it's, yeah, it's interesting, but I must, I must just watch something else as well. And I get that with newspapers. I don't feel when I read a newspaper, I'm getting the whole story and I, I you know every day I, I get the telegraph and the guardian because I feel I've got to get both I feel I just read one I feel no there's something I can see what you've done there I see how you've pointed that information and 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 um, quietly dropped that in made a less of a pro you know so I, 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 it's you know it's 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 a fascinating I think it's always been that way but now I just worry that news feels a bit battered by the politicians and isn't really fighting back, which is why, you know, the BBC hasn't said, no, Theresa May, you must debate. You must go on a live debate. We'll have one. If you're not going to turn up, we'll just have an empty chair. What are you going to do? No, it's not that. It's, oh, well, come on the one show then. No, <laughs> you must be busy. Sorry for the debate. You, uh, I can understand you're busy. You're the Prime Minister. You'll be busy. Sorry. We, we just thought we might ask if you did the debate. But no, clearly you can. Oh, well, sorry. Mm. You know, I just get annoyed with that. There we go. Right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm a huge fan of Veep, 
And All I right, just wanted you. to know if, um, from the beginning when you wrote the show, yeah. was it always your intention to have Selena Meyer get so close to the presidency, have a small taste of it, and then have it ripped away from her after the tie? And no, we, as I said, when we do episode one, we haven't written episode 10 of each series. Deliberately, as each season went on, we deliberately kept number 10, the final one of each, right towards the end. Um, it, more by about season two. I kind of liked at the end of each season slightly painting ourselves into a difficult corner. So by season two, she's told the president isn't going to rerun, so she's going to run. And then and, and season three, the president resigns, so she suddenly becomes the president while campaigning to be president. Uh, and season four, we ended on a tie break in the Electoral College, you know, and then I left and I handed that constitutional dilemma over to the <laughs> whole new team. And I just ran away. Uh, and, um, and I kind of like that because it, 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 it just, it forces you to think a bit harder about the next season. Would yeah. you have taken the current show any differently in a different direction? If I don't know, I'm a bit behind on the current show. I've seen the first couple of episodes, but I, I'm not up to speed on it. Yeah, probably, I, I'm sure we would have. When, when I handed over, I did talk to Dave Mandel. We met up. And I, I, we both agreed that she would, in the end, lose by the end of season five. But that was it. How he got her to that place, I said, is just up to him because he's got to be in charge and, and whatever. Um, but also, I think there's part of, you know, there's part of the British kind of, we don't do that many episodes. And there's a Simpsons um, program where, uh, where Homer is raising money to fund a seventh episode of his favourite British show. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we don't do that many episodes and doing Veep it was like every year it was 10 you know and it's a year long process so the sooner if you've done the first season you're back in writing the next season and then the next season so uh, within four years we've done 40 episodes and that's <coughs> I sort of felt 40 was probably enough for me and it needed fresh blood and new people coming in with diff different ideas yeah We've got time for a few more questions. Time for a few more. They've got to be absolutely excellent <coughs> questions because these are the last questions. So, so there's someone with their hand up over there. <coughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'm, glad we, I'm glad we got on to TV news and broadcasting uh -huh. um, because I was also like your, uh, the other question, um, thinking about um, the day-to-day -day in Brass Eye. And, you know, your emphasis so far has been that, that news hasn't changed, it hasn't improved, it hasn't moved on. In yeah. the format, but what has changed is the political news. Yes, and you did refer to this kind of change from having a broad centre ground to polarisation. Yeah. So the challenge for those anchor people has changed, and they're normalising and trying to stitch together more of a diverse range yeah. of views. And that, I think that's where they're getting contorted. I think they're still sticking to that traditional. We'll have one person, and we'll have the other person, and I'll say one thing to that person. But I'll then say the opposite to the, uh, you know, so you get this kind of, um, Mr. Churchill, Hitler does have a point. There are too many Jews and gypsies, don't you agree? <laughs> you know, just that kind of, I'll just say what that person said back to the, you know, and this ping pong that goes on. And then you end up by the end of it going, I really don't know what I've had here other than two completely sets of views. And the person in the middle hasn't done anything to try and break any or either of them down. He's, they've just kind of, played the kind of the umpire role of, of batting the ball backwards. I find that very unsatisfactory. I, I, again, I don't, I'm not, I don't know what the solution is. There's an element of, you know, also as resources of, you know, cuts and, and uh, you don't have the long term, especially in newspapers, the long term, you know, the reporter who's been allowed to spend five weeks on a story and doing the real in-depth analysis. A lot of it is the day-to-day. -day. And, and journalists now have to not just do the story, but do the website, do a little blog, do a kind of vlog, and do a, you know, tweet his way. And, 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 and therefore, it's all about, it's all about uh, recording what's happening now, but with not as much time to analyse what just happened. You know, it, it's, it's, there's no time to stand back and go, OK, I need to just spend the next two weeks just work out what the hell's happening in this election because it's, it's all a bit weird. No, it's got to be about, well, what did you think of Jeremy Corbyn today? He, he didn't answer that question. Theresa May, what was, she, she, what was she like? She was just talking about shoes. What's going on? You know, it's, you, know you then get sucked into that kind of minute-by-minute minute, um, uh, analysis rather than something that feels like... 
there's a, I mean, a little bit, I mean, you, you know, you, uh, on the plus side, you have got, you can go online and you can seek out sites that do, do a bit more of a, a background check on what's going on. But you have to, you know, you have to make the effort. You know, that's what I'd say. Right. Uh, I've, I seem to have answered everything. Uh, right, one fantastic question left. One. Or else I'll, okay, we'll turn over your papers, let the exam begin. <laughs> You're right there. Um, it, it's got to be good, this one. No pressure. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> no, it's fine. In comedy, you obviously satirise politicians and politics. Is there a politician that you actually respect and admire? Well, I, I was asking this, asked this question upstairs, and I, I, the, most of them are dead. You know, I was... Uh, um, <laughs> Because, no, I, uh, the only time I ever got close to working with a politician was Charles Kennedy, because he was the, when he was leader of Lib Dems, he was the only party leader at the time of the invasion of Iraq who said, this is monstrous, this is wrong. And at the time, he was harangued by the press for being almost treacherous. You know, our soldiers are going in, they're going in harm's way, how dare you question? Well, yes, that's what you do. You're not... You're not implying that they're wrong they're obey you know they're doing what they've been trained to do and what their leaders have told them to do what you do question are the people who've who've um, formulated those orders so uh, and and he was successful as as you know he 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 presided over the the lib dem vote going from like whatever it was 12 mps up to about 56 mps which then you know, Nick, Nick Clegg took over uh, after being his camera. So I, I kind of ad admired him for that. And he seemed kind of what you saw was what you got, really. So I, I kind of admired that. I admired Robin Cook for the stand he took around about that time as well. Um, but dead. So, <laughs> you know, on that bombshell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, thank you so thank much. Thank you very for much. That. Thank that you. Really That's great. Fun. Thank you very much.